Then I got a Sony cassette deck in. This is a three head one, an eBay purchase. And obviously the guy that uh, packed it up, well, he didn't know what he was doing because he didn't pack it properly and it's been damaged in transit. So this one came in to see if I can uh, get it going right now. The tape compartment won't open and it doesn't do a heck of a lot. So let's uh, see if I can bring this one back to life. So this is a Sony TCE KE 500 S. Three head cassette deck that uh, was brought in for service. The fellow that uh, owns this one bought it off eBay and unfortunately the person that shipped it didn't pack it very well and it has sustained some damage. As you can see there's damage in the corner here like it was bashed around and he tells me that the tape compartment will not open so we're gonna before I even plug it in we're gonna open it up and take a look inside this thing. Now this is being a Sony three head deck you would think it's gonna be a really good well-built machine but I can tell from the weight of this thing that there's not a heck of a lot in it. It's gonna be one of these ones that's really quite empty and will not be anywhere near the build of the JVC 1010 and that RSM 275 that I recently worked on which were very heavy and uh, were full of components. Let's uh, pop, top, pop the top off this one and we'll take a look inside and see why this one's not working. The fellow that brought me this for repair, he's a customer that's brought me a few things in the past to, to work on. And he's also given me a bunch of old camcorders as a donation to work on for future projects. So future projects got some CCD TR-54 uh, this is a speaker of some type sharper image what else do we have in here CCD TR-9 CCD what is this one TR-23 and a uh, CCD TR-6. So I have four camcorders that I'm going to uh, see if I can get them working and then uh, if I can, I'll sell them. For people that are looking for uh, cameras to transfer tape and stuff. I don't however have the power supplies for them so if I can get them going, they'll be sold as is, with, with no power supply. Back to the task at hand. Of course, just screw in the back. Get this one opened up before I plug it in. Just so that if there's anything that's damaged, we won't damage it further. It. it this thing stinks like come from a smoker's place my shop is not going to smell like cigarettes here's the uh, guts to this one as you can see it's not empty by any stretch of imagination it's got a nice big circuit board in it and here's the mechanism it's a I think this is a three motor or is it a two motor this is a two motor design on this one now this one's only a single capstan design Three head single capstan. But let's uh, see why it's not opening. The owner of it assumes it was because it was, was damaged, it's been bent, but I'm not so sure that that's the problem. Let's find out what it does. Power comes on. What is it doing? Okay, motor's turning. I 
don't believe the capstan is turning. It's not. There, now it's turning. Oh, that motor is making a lot of noise. So the flywheel is jammed. Now the tape compartment opens. Let's uh, just try it out and see whether it works. A group of people, and they make decisions behind closed and locked doors that affect the lives of well, that American, you and me. Doesn't sound that good. It's kind of humming, isn't it? You know why it's humming, right? It doesn't know the words. We'll just check out a uh, 440 and a 3 kilohertz tone. This is the 440. We'll see how that. It's got, it's got a noise in the background. It is playing the 440 tape. Okay. But it's got no noise in the background. And the 3 kilohertz tape. It's not the right speed obviously um, the noise itself unfortunately <clears throat> it's coming from the motor the motor is shot on this thing that's where the problem that's where that noise is coming from this is what happens when you buy things off of eBay you can still hear the noise there I think it's the motor. It's not as bad now as it was before. I'll slow the motor down a bit. See whether the noise gets louder. Delta's slipping for one. Uh, Flutter. Gonna uh, find a tape that's got some music on it. Okay, this tape I know has good sound on it because I've used it before and I recorded this on one of my own decks. right the motor is noisy on this unit the motor itself is probably almost worn out it's the bearing if I just if I just touch it ever so slightly the noise goes away and maybe a different belt might uh, different belt might uh, alleviate some of that noise just by put, putting a bit more tension on the actual motor shaft but the motor itself is on its last leg. Look at all the plastic on this thing, right? This was after Sony went to, went to, I almost said it, I almost said a word that could get me hit for advertising. Let's just say after Sony's heyday was done and everything went plastic. You can see that this thing was bounced though. Look, at, look at, it's not even level. Like it's got a twist in the mechanism. That's not what's causing the, the uh, noise, but it uh, is likely what's causing the poor playback. Or one of the factors for the poor playback. The uh, head may be out of alignment. I'm just gonna see if it needs to be cleaned. We can pull the front cover off a little more accessible to uh, clean 
made them easy to clean. You pull the front uh, piece off and you can get direct access to the head itself here. And there are um, adjustment slots to align the head if necessary. It's got a six position switch because it, it supports WB, C and S, <clears throat> both with an MPX filter on or off. Lots of take up torque. Okay. I'm just gonna clean those heads if the uh, the high end improves on it. It's actually not sounding too bad now other than all the noise that's in the background from the uh, the motor. The reason we're getting all that that noise is the uh, brushes in the motor are uh, sparking and they're being picked up by the uh, head preamplifier. So you're hearing that, that crackling sound. See, so this is one of the strengths of these units is you can clean the head very easily. You get to the pinch roller, you can get to the capstan, and you can clean all that dirt off of the capstan and the pinch roller because it's filthy. Like it's really, really dirty, this thing. See what I mean? It's like this thing's never been cleaned. It's gonna get this thing to run. I like to run the motor just so I can clean the capstan shaft a little easier if it was spinning. It makes it easier to clean if it's spinning. Because I gotta.
So that's what came off of the capstan pinch roller and heads. It should sound better already. Yeah, high frequencies come back. This one being a three head deck can certainly uh, do with a demagnetizing. As a two head deck, you don't need to demagnetize. All you need to do is put it into record because the record bias, when the AC record bias comes on, that will instantly demagnetize the erase head and a record play head. But on a three head deck, it will only demagnetize the record head because the play head obviously never sees a bias signal. So three head decks, you do need to demagnetize them from time to time. So let's do that now. I get asked this question all the time too. I made my own tape head demagnetizer by just coiling some magnet wire that I salvaged out of an old motor from a cordless drill around a, an iron screw or a steel screw. And I'm just using a little transformer. I just used what I had the one I'm using is 18 volts at one amp. It's kind of overkill. It's actually probably too strong. A 12 volt transformer. It needs to be an AC, even a seven and a half volt. As long as it's an AC output, will work fine. Um, somebody asked me if you can use a, a, a Variac dialed down or a auto transformer, and the answer is no. The reason you can't is because you'd be handling mains voltage, mains current at your hand. This is an isolation transformer by the nature that it is a transformer. So the secondary has no connection whatsoever to the line's main voltage. So if you're going to build one, just any little any type of transformer, as long as it's not a switching power supply, you can take a regular AC to DC wall warp, one that puts out like 12 volts DC like this, crack it open, take the capacitor out, and Take the diodes out so that the power cord leaving it is connected directly to the winding of the transformer and that'll do the same thing. Um, I'm going to plug this thing in. I'm going to give the heads just a, a once over with my little demagnetizer here. Say mine is overkill because I'm driving way too much current into this thing. This will actually get hot. If I leave this thing plugged in for more than about a minute it'll actually get warm. I'm drawing full power. But saying that it does get the job done and it gets the job done very nicely without even having to get that close to the head because the magnetic field this thing throws off will, will actually go about two or three inches away from it so i don't even have to touch the head with this thing i just get it in there same with the caption shaft i just take it down to within about a half an inch and just move it around like that and then slowly in a, in, moving it in a circular motion slowly remove it and that's about the duty cycle of this thing because this thing is starting to get warm not hot yet but it's starting to it's starting to heat up and that's just because I don't have enough wire wrapped around here for the voltage that I'm putting in um, 12 volt transformer for this length of wire would have done just fine after all this was the winding out of a 12 volt motor out of a drill I'm gonna rewind this back to the beginning and see how it sounds with the leader Oops, that was the wrong button try that take it all the way back to the beginning Yeah, you can hear the noise. You hear it? First thing I need to do on this one is address the slipping belt problem. So to do that, we're going to pull the mechanism out. That way I can go through the mechanism, change out that slipping belt, and we'll see whether we can lubricate that motor and try and get some life out of it and maybe quieten this thing down a bit. So to take the mechanism out on this, I'm going to first of all remove the power. I'm going to remove the cords, uh, the flat cables that plug into the mechanism and uh, then I should be able to just remove a couple screws and remove the mechanism from this unit. To remove the deck, there are two screws on the bottom come out. Um, the other screws that hold this in are these two up here and of course they're smaller. Oh, 
Jeez. Fooled you guys. Remember, I already unplugged it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be laying my hand across the mains voltage. Yes, this one you gotta keep, be careful because the mains voltage is exposed right there and there. So if you stick your hand in there and you're plugged in, you're going to do a little dance. I think I gotta open that up. And then the mechanism should lift out on this one. I say should because I think I may have to remove the front panel as well because I can't move the mechanism back far enough to get it out from the front. So I gotta, I gotta take out the screws. Compared to my techniques that I just worked on, this one's a walk in the park. You also don't give yourself a hernia lifting it like, like the JVC TDW 1010. And my RSM-275, those units weigh in at uh, uh, about 10 or 12 kilograms. So about 22, 20, between 22 and 24 pounds. They are, they are heavy beasts. Okay, once I remove the front, now I can tilt the mechanism and take the mechanism out. There's a couple more plugs I gotta undo here, I think. Remove it. Got to get the whole front loaded front. Uh, yeah, the head's still plugged in. That's why. And that, or those are the wires there. Take out the head block. The head plugs in here and at the back. and these two at the back here. The red and the red plug being record, that one being a race, and that one's the playback head. So now that I've got the mechanism out, let's throw the rest of the chassis in the pile of, of equipment and we can work on the deck itself. But you gotta you gotta be able to pull the front off enough so that you can get this whole cassette assembly out because it has to come out from underneath here. Okay, first we'll unplug the real motor. And then unplug the capstan motor. Remove the screw that holds the little circuit board in place. And remove the circuit board. And now there's another screw that holds this. There's two more screws that hold the chassis on. The plastic chassis. One of them is this one here. Note the length of the screws. Because some of the screws may be longer than the others. In this case, they're both the same. These three screws are the same length. Now I can remove the motor to get to the belt. See if I can find a new belt. This one here is kind of kind of kind of a stretchy. As you can see, the mechanism on this one is controlled by this plastic cam gear. So if the belt starts to slip then uh, the mechanism doesn't work very well. Um, there was a dual capstan version of this type of chassis and it actually had the capstan there. But this is not one because the erase head is right where that is. Actually, it probably wasn't a dual capstan. It was probably auto-reverse. In fact, I'm going to say that it was an auto-reverse mechanism that they used uh, the second capstan for because Sony wasn't. Unless you got into the real high-end the TCK um, series, they didn't use a lot of... Uh, of dual caps and designs. And this, even though it's a three head deck, 
is not uh, something that would be considered a very high-end deck. But again, this, this deck would have been made in the twilight years of cassette. You know, you, if you wanted a good cassette deck, you had to get one from the, from the early 1980s. Uh, cassette decks made in 82, 83, 84, they were the best of all the years for cassette decks. That's when they had the sound quality the best, the lowest wild flutter, the most accurate tape transports, just the best sounding was in those years. RSM 275, the RSM 3s, I think it's the 375 was the three head version of what I have. And uh, that JVC K1010, for example, even the techniques, uh, what is it, the R, what is it, RS6, I forget the number of it, it's sitting right here too. The M63, even the M63, which is about a 1976-77 three-head mechanical deck, probably sounds better than this one. This one, I believe, 1996, maybe 96-97, somewhere in there. This is a relatively late uh, cassette deck, and cassette decks were well on their way to becoming obsolete when this unit would have been produced, as you can tell just from how flimsy the mechanism is, it's, you know, full of plastic. I'm going to check my stock of belts and see if I can find one that's going to be suitable for this one. Still hasn't addressed the problem that that motor's creating noise, but it might be because it's so loose that the the bearing itself is is uh, is slipping. We'll try and we'll try and quieten this thing down a bit. Let's take the motor out from the chassis. I want to try and open the motor up if I can and uh, see whether I can get some lubricant into these bearings. As you can hear, I don't know if you can hear, but it is quite noisy. If I apply power to this thing, it'll spin up. I'm thinking if I can get some lubricant down into the actual uh, bearing itself on both sides, I might be able to extend its life a little bit. We pop these motors apart by just prying away the the edge a little bit. That way I can get a screwdriver under here and pop it open. Lift it up. Cut that bit of tape. Got to unsolder this little ground pin over here. There we go. Now that part's removed. If I remove the pulley from the front by just popping it off, I can then push the entire mechanism part and the tire rotor with the stator and everything on the back I can push that right through and remove it so that I can lubricate the front and the back side of the bearing there we go now we get the motor apart I can now put some oil down into this back bearing here and the same with the front bearing and that should extend the life I'm also going to spray some cleaner down into the into the contacts here just to clean them up a bit. In fact, the cleaner would act as a pretty darn good lubricant because um, most of these cleaners have oil in them. You know, they have a they have a lubricant in them. So first, I'm going to try and get some oil down into the. Uh, the bearing at the back, so I'm just going to use my, my little screwdriver here to transfer a drop of oil down into this bearing at the back. Without 
without taking apart the the, uh, the brushes and the uh, armature stator, whatever you want to call it. Some, I got some oil down into that back bearing, it's turning nice and smoothly. Uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll get some some cleaner. I'm going to use my deoxit D100. I'm going to use this stuff because it's got the needle dropper. I'm going to put a little bit right onto the brush contacts themselves. Because in this case they're just metal, they're metal contacts. So we'll put some onto the actual rotor, and that should clean up those contacts, especially if they're sparking at all. Try and minimize the noise, and then finally I'm going to put a drop of oil onto the front shaft, and then reassemble the motor. And we'll see how it uh, see how it sounds. So there's a drop of oil onto there. Now I'm just going to put the motor back together and hold it in place so it doesn't fly together. on the back. And snap it back together. Using my stolen pliers that I stole from BCIT. I think I've told you guys that story before. See, it says it says BCIT, TV production. That's where I went to school. And I guess what happened? It was I didn't steal them intentionally. It was I was my I would have been doing lighting because we did everything we, like we worked in the studio, right? So. We learned lighting and we learned sound and we learned editing and production and all the other stuff. And I guess I guess what happened was I um, had them in my pocket at the end of the course and I went home and forgot about them. And forgot to take them back. Reconnect the ground. There we go. Shall we see if the motor works? Okay, got my 12 volt power supply connected. Negative to negative. Oh, it's nice and quiet. Yes, nice and quiet. Put the pulley back on. I don't know if you guys can see the motor spinning or not, but. Uh, I know if I put a if I put a, something on there so you guys can see it spin. What can I put on there? A mark? My belt pen? Sure, why not? Let's put a let's put a black mark on here. So you guys can see it spinning. Just so you can you'll know that it is actually spinning. You don't have to take my word for it that it is turning. It's gonna speed it's gonna go up to full speed. So there is you can see the black mark and there it goes. See? It is spinning. And it's nice and quiet. And that's what we want. Now, time to put the motor back into the uh, chassis here. And 
And if you're not sure which way it came out, you can always fit the circuit board back in to see. Because the motor will go in in different orientations. But it normally goes in like that with the the wires leading from the bottom. If I, if I hold up the circuit board here so you can see, if I put the circuit board in place, you'll see that the connector lines up. So now the motor is back in place and it's nice and quiet. Next, let's uh, find a belt. Okay, I found another belt that uh, I don't know if this one's going to be tight enough. I don't want them to be too tight, but uh, this one here is very close to the original one in size. I'm going to try and wrap it around here and put the motor back in and see whether it will uh, provide me with enough torque to uh, operate the mechanism. I gotta pull this other belt over this pulley while I'm at it. there. Okay, that one's on. I'm just going to put uh, one of the screws in here just to hold this in place so that I can uh, thread the other belt around. Okay, now let's just put the caps and belt on the motor and see whether I've got enough torque to spin this thing. I'll apply power from my power supply. Yeah, we look okay. Just gonna push the pulley back a little bit. Not too much. This is just to center the uh, the belt on on the uh, the flywheel. There we go. Belt is centered on the flywheel, and as you can see, maybe you can't see, <laughs> it is spinning nicely. Okay, let's um, put this thing back together. And see whether I've made any improvement to the way it operates. So I'll put the board back in place and the other two screws.
Once the board's in place, we'll plug the motors in. This is the motor speed control. This is a four wire motor, so the speed control is external. It is not in here, it's there on these type of motors. It's always external. Let me grab the rest of the unit. We'll pop the chassis back in and see how this unit sounds now that the motor has been lubricated and had the contacts cleaned for the uh, stator and the brushes. One thing you'll need to do if the mechanism won't release, like if you've changed the position of that cam gear, you actually have to release it by pushing on that little lever there. And then you can turn the flywheel by hand to lower down the heads in order to release it. Otherwise, it's going to lock it into position. So that's the this is the release here, this little lever here. That's the one that releases the, the mechanism so that it can be turned by hand to lower down the cam. Otherwise, you'll never be able to open up the cassette tray to uh, put the machine back together. And this has got to come out in order to fit the uh, chassis in. You've got to be able to remove this so that you can get the cassette compartment through here. Match will reconnect the power cables to the switchboard and the motorboard. Reconnect the head and the record play head and the um, erase head. So there's the record head. It's red, red for record. And it just plugs in on this port pins header on the board, if you want to call it. The play head goes over to the white header over here. Still making a lot of noise. Man, this is chest. mutes it once I did that but that's yeah, still making noise you see it's not that it wasn't a capsule motor one of the other is maybe this motor is causing the noise it sounds like motor noise that's for sure Is it the other motor that's causing the noise? So you got this big racket. I'm just going to unplug the other motor. See whether that's the one that's throwing all that noise. Now, of course, now it'll eat the tape if I don't have a, if I don't have a real motor. But not the, it's not that motor. 
Somewhere we're getting noise into this thing. I mean, it's a significant, it's a significant noise. It's zero dB on the meters with no sound. Check this out. As soon as I press play, even before the music starts, right? It's just ridiculous, even with Dolby on, right? I need to determine where is that noise getting in? Is it getting into the preamp or is it getting into the head? One way we can check that is to unplug the head and see whether the circuitry is still noisy without the playback head. And it is, but not as noisy. The, the preamp is very sensitive, but that, the, that noise is getting in and being picked up by the head. I'm curious as to what's causing it. Um, shouldn't be anything running here in the shop. I've got a light running behind me. I've got an LED TV under test. I'll plug the head back in. We'll just see if something external is causing that noise. Well, CRT clock that runs here. Watch when I turn it off. There it's on. So it is picking up some interference from the flyback on this little CRT clock. Interesting. I wonder if I put the metal cover on whether that'll shield it. It's obviously picking up interference from something. I have no idea what it could be, but if it is something getting into it externally, then putting the top cover on should quieten it down. And it, and it doesn't, although I haven't put the screws in to ground it, but it hasn't made any difference. I have a visitor. To give you an idea how bad this is, I've gone and got a blank tape. This is a completely blank tape there's nothing on it yet there's like minus 10 dB of noise and if I turn on the Dolby Just touching it. May send Morse code. Um, hmm. This is a um, an odd problem. I'm thinking it, it's got to be. I'm making you guys go deaf, aren't I, with all that noise? Uh, this has got to be damaged. Maybe that circuit board has a crack on it when this thing was shipped and it was bashed around, but um, we have a significant noise problem I'm going to have to investigate. So I guess we'll pull the board out and we'll look at the board and see if there's any connections broken or any damage to it. That's the only thing I can think of is somewhere along the line when this thing was shipped, it, uh, we know it was beat up because the back corners bashed in. It must have done some other damage to the board. Maybe a cracked ground or something, but that noise is just unbearable and we have to figure out what's doing it.
So let's pull the board out and uh, go through it with a fine tooth comb. The one screw in the back here holds the heat sink on for the regulators. We'll remove that and I'm going to remove the screw here. It holds the the jack panel in place and of course the screws that hold the back panel in place. We'll remove all of these. The circuit board is not held in place with screws. It's held in place on plastic standoffs. So I'm expecting that there's going to be a crack somewhere on this board. And this is the problem when you buy things off of eBay. Is that they, they never arrive in working condition. Or very rarely. Usually something goes wrong with them in transport because the carriers don't care they throw things around doesn't matter what carrier you use if you put fragile on the box they'll be sure to drop it kick it throw it drop it off the back of a truck because they don't care I guess when you've got you got you know monkeys working for you because when you pay peanuts you get monkeys I guess when you got a bunch of uh, underpaid workers that have to haul this stuff around every day all day they uh, just don't really care about what happens to it I guess I really don't have to remove that I'm just going to I'm going to unplug everything here. Get the board out so that we can inspect it. Take all the plugs out off the main board. Now I should be able to lift the board out and see if there's any damage, like where these plugs plug in, for example, where these modules plug in. So I got the board out, just about took my finger off on the, the uh, sharpest knife edge to the cabinet. I'm kind of looking at these, the way these plugs are, look at how loose these are. This is the bias calibration oscillator. Got a record Dolby and a play Dolby, and this one here I think is the AMS. Doesn't look bad, the connections. I don't see cracks on the, any of the solder here on the playback Dolby and the record Dolby board. Like, I don't see any obvious uh, broken connections there. Looking on the bottom of the board here, again, I don't. Uh, 
I don't see anything that's, you know, I don't see any physical crack that jumps out unless there's a hairline fracture, but I'm just going to go over the board here. and It almost sounds like a, a grounding problem. Maybe around the head. Certainly when the cabinet is touched, it, uh, the noise becomes much greater. So I'm just kind of looking at the regulators, see if there's any bad connections that are obvious on some of these regulators down here. But I don't see any. Possibly, possibly that one. That's the regulator that uh, is attached to the back. I'll try reflowing that one. And some of the grounds over here by the, the jack. Inputs and outputs. Oh, this is broken right here. There's one right here. See the crack? There's a crack right here on this on this trace. And that's a ground that goes through. I wonder if that's where the problem is. This is this, this is cracked right in here, right on both sides here. See, just from the, uh, the the way it sounds, it sure looks like a ground. And this being at the back of the board, this is where the, the unit was dropped. I would expect that any damage I find is going to be in this back side of the board. Because I think it was dropped on its back. The way that that cabinet is bent, it sustained a fair bit of force. I'm going to get my microscope and uh, we're going to we're going to give this a much closer look with the microscope Where I'm most uh, concerned about is the areas around where the board is attached by the standoffs because this would have been when the unit was was banged around this is where the, the uh, shock would have been is right here. And of course the connectors in the back which I, I saw a crack right, right here between here and here. And you can see this is a ground 
that uh, starts out over way over here looks like it's just a shield doesn't it like, this goes all the way through connects over to here to here and then back around ends up with that transistor it looks like CP201 is uh, where one of the modules plugs in. The other modules are down here. This one's CP141. It's not moving, so it's not broken. That connection there doesn't look too good, does it? This one here is um, questionable. I'm watching what I'm doing on camera, so hopefully I'm doing it right because I'm not looking at the board. I'm looking up at the screen as I do this. It's easier to see what I'm doing on camera than it is looking down at the board because the camera's in the way. This is the playback Dolby board. Since they record Dolby board. That one there looks questionable That one looks questionable.
those ones look questionable. <laughs> Move it from the other side. That's the main rectifier. All that noise you hear in the background, it's my messenger going off. I got a couple of buddies that are having an argument about. It's kind of fun to read some of the comments and some of their theories. Amusing. By the way, if you guys are wondering, this is not actually a microscope. This is just the macro on my camera. It's really good. This this camera is really good macro. I can get even closer than this. I think. I can go right into there. It needs a microscope when your camera can get you that good a picture. I mean, everything I'm looking at here looks good. I don't see any cracks. I I've been looking around the edges of the board because if there's going to be any cracks, they're going to be, I would think, near the edge. before they're in the middle. Just that's the way it usually happens, right? And I don't see anything here. So I'm gonna put this back together and see what happens. This is the playback head connector right here. I know it definitely was picking up noise from my little my little CRT that I just display the time on because the the noise level dropped when I turned that off. So that's just a little four inch black and white CRT. So the noise is getting into this thing externally because when I unplugged the head, the noise level dropped big time. 
So I wonder, it, it could even be the head wire. You know, I didn't look at that, but uh, we'll take a look at that. The board here looks good, other than that connection on the uh, on the output back here, the ground. Other than that, and a couple of other connections, the board looks good. I'll have to, I'm going to check the head wires too, because... That's all that holds the board in, is uh, those, uh, those clips. Okay, time to put all the, all the plugs back in. Fortunately, most of the plugs are color-coded, so it's easy to figure out where they go. And that, that is unless you're colorblind and that could be a problem. Speaking of colorblind, my daughter was one time dating a guy that was uh, going to school to learn to program video games and he's colorblind. Yeah. What do you think his chances of success in that field are? I would say a snowball has a better chance in hell. But then, hey, what can I say? The length this video is getting, I'm getting into uh, Mr. Carlson territory. Wow, an hour and 13 minutes and we still don't have this thing working. Well, that one went, where did that one go? That one goes here. There's one more. connector. Where the heck's this one? Oh, over here. That should have all the connectors back in place. The wire ties in. Make everything like it was in the factory. All the grounds are in place. Well, let's plug it in and see if we've still got that horrible noise. tape that I've got in here right now. that that break back the ground had to be that Brad that that break on the board back here at the ground because that's the only thing I did well I I resoldered a few other connections that's the one I spotted this thing appears to be working let's check the speed make sure the speed's right 
Okay, let's check the speed. 3.03. .03. We can adjust that down with that control on the back. Three kilohertz. Like always, we're going to make a uh, a test recording. So we're going to do a calibration on this thing first. Got a blank tape in. Hit record. Calibration. And uh, I can hit play. I think record and play. We're in calibration now, and I should get a tone of this thing. There we go. And then I get the bias adjustment and the level adjustment. You want to play with the bias control to get your high and your low level. Equal. Old tapes. What can you say? You adjust your level and bias control to get your high and your low sitting on the little calibration mark there. Bias control affects the highs and the level affects the low. I'm close enough for this old tape. That's what it's doing, it's recording. Alternating between a high and a low tone. See? That's what um, this deck does. Is it um, switches between a, a high frequency and a low frequency, and then uh, the two meters, one displays the four, 400 hertz, the other one displays the six killer six kilohertz or seven kilohertz or whatever it's using anyway uh, that's how you set up the bias on one of these ones we'll try the same thing on a type 2 tape there we go better tape so now I can adjust my my bias levels affecting the high which is this one here I turn the bias down you see the highs go up I turn the bias up the highs come down I get I get it so that it's as close to that mark as possible and then the level do the same with the level and the 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 idea is that you get the two of them spot on for the tape again when these levels shift a bit that's just the tapes themselves there we go that's about as good as I think we're gonna see those are dropouts that are causing that and the tape shifting slightly First time I tested it, it was on a type 1 tape. This is a type 2 tape. A little bit better tape than the first one. Again. So now we're going to rewind this tape. I'm going to make a recording on the tape. We're going to do it in Dolby S. Just for, uh, for fun. So we can see how Dolby S sounds. And I'm going to play the tape back into the uh, into the camera like we've done on prior videos so you can hear how this thing sounds so let's set up our let's set up our recording set my levels oh gotta clean those controls let's do that while I'm at it since I don't feel like taking this thing all apart again I think I can get into the control from in here so I'm going to spray it into the control from here Put the knob back on. Did I hear a cat? There's a cat in here visiting me. A big cat.
squat. I have a visitor. If I push the recorder back, you might even climb up on the bench. There he is. Okay, you've had your 15 seconds of fame. Goodbye. Got a track ready to go here from my MP3 player, so let's let her rip. Now this being a uh, three head deck, I can hit the monitor button and monitor what's coming off tape. So now I'm hearing exactly what's being recorded as it's being recorded. So it sounds pretty damn good to my ears over these speakers. I was thoroughly enjoying that until that. <laughs> That's how you say, it's an old tape. Something was spilled on there. We'll play this back from, from the beginning until, well, until it stopped. I was getting into that track too. Uh, I, you guys know I use uh, Music Bakery's music exclusively. And that goes back like 20 years when I was in the production business, my former business partner who passed away about, I guess about 11, 12 years ago now, but um, uh, he went nuts and bought all these bloody CDs. Like we got a dozen, I think of them, of the CDs. It's got all the different lengths of like the shorter and longer versions and, and the underscores and so forth. But um, uh, Music Bakery, for those of you that don't know, they are a clearinghouse for professionally produced royalty-free tracks that you can use. The composer Jack Walden Mayer writes all this music, and it's all performed by professional studio musicians. So the guys that do this stuff are the best of the best. And anybody who knows, anybody who's been a studio musician, I know a couple people that were studio musicians, and that's all they did is they just they they recorded all kinds of famous acts music because the, the the members of the band weren't that good and the studio called in a pro to fill in anyway i'm going to play this one back this is a great track uh, too bad the tape was munched but uh i think you guys will enjoy it up to the point where it, it dies
I'm gonna stop the live recording there because the tape's gonna come, it's gonna munch up in here in a minute and everything's gonna just go bleh. Anyway, that's not bad, not bad sound at all. After all, it is a Sony, but yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, as I say, um, this deck is now fixed. We had a couple of issues with it. Damage to the circuit board. That motor was noisy. It needed a new capstan belt. It's got a new belt. It's um, got a lubricated motor. And it's nice and quiet now. And I'm going to stop this because that's about right where that thing died. And I don't really feel like cleaning the heads for a third time. So anyway, that one, this one's done. I'm going to uh, mark this tape that it is damaged. There. So that I know in the future I'll wind it past that damaged part. And uh, I'll remember that for the future. I don't know what got on there. But something, something on there is spilt on that tape and it sticks to the heads and everything when it goes through. Anyway, uh, we're done on this one. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.